Lynn. I'm a botanist at MPG Ranch, and I'm going to tell you about the monitoring, pollinator monitoring program we initiated this year. And in the spirit of some of the other presentations, who can tell me what this bee is? <laughs> I don't have chocolate. Uh, this is a little leaf cutter bee. Okay, I'm going to go over some of my research objectives and methods. Um, the conclusions that we came up with and then um, or some of the preliminary conclusions and then um, then we're going to look at some really cool bee pictures. So here's we have three research object objectives. The first one is to document bee species richness and abundance at the monitoring sites accounting for temporal and spatial differences. So we all know MPG Ranch is a big place with a lot of different um, habitats and um, we needed to account for that. Also bees live for only a few weeks at a time and they, uh, in general, and they um, span the whole growing season so we needed to, in order to sample them, we needed to sample throughout the season. Secondly, we wanted to monitor how bee communities change in response to restoration treatments. A lot of restoration is going on on the ranch and some communities are pretty degraded. Um, in this way, we're using bees as a response variable. And the third thing we're doing is uh, attempting to contribute to the knowledge base regarding bees in our area. There's really just a lack of um, information about bees around here and so any information that we came up with um, could add to the general knowledge. And then, um, this is for Christy. This is a variegated fritillary, which we had an eruption of uh, last September. They're an occasional. And obviously, this is not a, uh, it's a pollinator, but not a bee. I'm only monitoring um, bees. <laughs> not hummingbirds, not flies, not beetles, or bats. So here's a ranch. Um, it's been overlaid with this grid of 570 points that we've all seen. Uh, a vegetation, sur vegetation surveys have been conducted at every one of these monitoring sites, or every one of these um, points on the grid, and all that veg data was um, used to classify each of those sites into community types using a twin span analysis, and that's the work that Dan did. Um, twin span analysis resulted in 48 community types. So of the 570 points that we have on the ranch, 28 of them have been chosen as intensive study points. Um, and the reason why we chose these were to represent as many twin span classes as possible. Uh, they were also of interest based on restoration goals and easily accessible by road. I think two more have been added to this, so now there's 30. And here's some of the monitoring efforts that are taking place at these study points. It looks like we can also add hummingbirds to this too, I think, from Kerr's presentation yesterday. And I'm doing the pollinator part of it. So in 2013, we monitored 24 out of the 28 pollinator points. We didn't do any of these points here in Whaley Draw. There were bee boxes right here. Um, plus, there, I wasn't sure if we were going to have enough people, but um, uh, so we did only 24 of them. And we had five sampling rounds, uh, once in June, twice in July, once in August, and once in September. So. You may have noticed that I um, am, have been introduced as a botanist and uh, not an entomologist, and maybe you get this Star Trek reference. Um, <laughs> but luckily, there's a lot of people out here or out in the world who um, see that bees are important, but there's just not a lot of entomologists or bee biologists around, and so, um, Bee biologists and statisticians have come up with a way for um, the common folk like me to um, monitor bee populations. And this is the reference for that. I'm going to provide a, works, um, a little reference that's on the last 
slide with the website. All of the information about the methods that I'm using is available online, um, including, th so this is a paper about it, uh, that outlines all the protocols and then it provides all the justification for the color of um, bowls we use and the size of the bowls and the distance the bowls are placed apart and um, how often they need to be sampled and so that's all available. Um, and so, among other things, it's useful for testing hypotheses regarding bee habitat relationships, and that's exactly what we're trying to do, so this works great. The two main components of the protocol include pan trapping and netting, and I'll go over that. Um, we have these bulls, and they passively sample bees at the site, but some bee species can escape these pan traps or bulls or just simply don't visit them, and so netting is another component of sampling that um, perhaps samples from the bees that aren't being sampled by the bulls. Okay, so pan trapping. Warm sunny days only is when we go out and that's not a um, field work cop out. Uh, that's just because it's when the bees are out too. So they only forage on warm sunny days and darn it, that's the only days we can do it. So I lay out two transects. Um, at the beginning of the season, they run north, south, east, and west just for, because that's easy to remember, and they're 50 meters long and they intersect at plot center. We place 21 um, little solo cups. They're like the kind of cups you get uh, like your condiments in at a restaurant. Um, they have soapy water in them and they're placed five meters apart along the transects for a, to a total of 27 on each side. They're fluorescent blue, fluorescent yellow, or white. The blue and yellow have to fluoresce under a black light, otherwise they're not fluorescent, right? So those are the colors that catch the most bees, so that those are the colors we use. They're set out by nine, and then the contents are collected after three. And here's a little schematic of how this all happens. Um, we locate plot center, this happens right at the beginning of the field season. Um, shoot two transects, place red flags on the ends. If you guys drive the ranch roads and see red flags, they're for pollinator monitoring. Don't move them. Uh, we place a bowl at center and then bowls along the arms of the transects for uh, a total of 21 bowls. And here's Tegan collecting pan trap contents out by 0.108. Uh, this is the results of pan trapping. Uh, you can see there's a, a line of bulls there, passively sampling bees. We come back after three and here's what we find. Sometimes there's a little bycatch in there. We strain the contents through um, a, a little brine shrimp net and uh, that goes into a whirl pack bag with some alcohol and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so netting's the second component, also warm sunny days only. Uh, two samplers net at each site for 15 minutes for a total of 30 sampler minutes. This year I did the sampling um, from nine to noon. The protocols call for an hour of sampling in the morning and an hour of sampling in the afternoon which is um, a lot of, of netting, really, and um, <laughs> with 28 sites or even 24 sites, it was, that's, um, a, it's a lot of time. So the netting takes place at once at each site during each sampling period. So we lay out bowls and then people sample as many of the sites that they can and then the following day, and we were lucky last year, always the following day was also nice. Um, we sample the rest, the remaining ones, the, the next day. And here we have some samplers in action. There's Chris, he's collecting a netted bee there at one of the points in uh, mid-August. And here's Beth and Carly, also known as the Soccer Girls, um, collecting in the North Center Pivot. And this is what we end up with. So here's netted, these are from the bull traps, these are the bees that were strain through the um, mesh and then we're, they're put in these whirl pack bags with alcohol and a label um, and these are the netted bees 
Uh, they're put in these collection tubes and frozen until we send them off. And we send them off, to, so I don't identify these bees. Identifying bees to species um, is notoriously difficult, and so we send them off to the, to the real experts. And uh, this is my co-author, Skylar Burroughs. Um, he is at the USDA ARS Bee Biology and Systematics Lab in Logan, Utah. And here's Skylar, hard at work. And these are some MPG bees. And here's the totals from this year. From our five sampling efforts, we caught 11,000 bees. And of those 11,000 bees, 132 bee species were identified, representing 58 subgenera and 32 genera. 74 of those 132 species are new Montana records. Yeah, right, isn't that great? For the um, Bee Biology and Systematics Lab database or any database that they have access to. So talking to Schuyler about this, he said that the 74 species that are new Montana records most of them have been collected all around Montana, but there just hasn't been much collecting in Montana or any collecting that's happened. People aren't telling anyone about it. So if you're not telling people about the bees that you've collected, then, um, uh, then no one can benefit from that. One specimen in our collection was a first catch from west of the Continental Divide a little digger bee called Anthophora walshii. I don't have a picture of him, but uh, uh, the nearest western collection um, to ours is in North Dakota. And everything else was found east. Is all, all the other Anthophoras are found east of, of there. There's two rare species that were caught that aren't, weren't previously known to exist in our area. Um, Neither of these species are officially described, the Stellus banachi and Stellus species B, um, just because there hasn't been a publication. But Stellus banachi is only known from, uh, there's only two individuals that have been caught uh, from Utah. And uh, then we caught two at MPG. So we essentially doubled the known collections of uh, Stellus banachi. And then Stella species B has only been known from California before this season. There's a potentially new species that for now they're calling Neopocytes fulva ventris. It's a little cuckoo bee. Um, it's been found in California and Utah. If, uh, there's enough differences in morphology that they think it's a different species from Neopocytes fulva ventris. But uh, that it just takes more work to decide if it's a new species or not. If nothing else, it's an enormous range expansion. And now the redundancy analysis of our samples. Almost 20% of the variation in our data is due to the timing of the sampling, which isn't totally unexpected because um, bees come out at different times of the year. 30% of the variation is due to the site. And almost 50% of the variation can be explained by both the site and the timing of the sampling. 30% of variation is explained by the vegetation. So here's some of the results um, in a more visual kind of a schematic that Dan created. Um, the, the larger numbers correspond to a larger number of species caught. The two places that I found particularly interesting, um, well, they are all interesting, really, but uh, 523, this site is a, like a, just a little forest clearing, and then 226, and that's kind of up near Baldy Ridge, um, or the North Ridge, I mean. And then 226 is in the agricultural area, the North Pivot. Um, it had a lot of species, especially compared to these other north center pivot sites that were really close by. I'm not really sure why. And then this is abundance of individuals, so just the numbers of bees that we got from these sites. Here's 523. We just didn't get a lot of bees here. It's, like I said, it's a forest clearing. It's not this wide open sunny grassland. Um, and then uh, this is 
226 again and in the north center pivot and it's got it had a lot of different species and it has a lot of individuals here's some baldy these are up near baldy not a lot of individuals coming off of that uh, this is the killed crested area um, lots of species lots of individuals coming out of that and this is the measure this is the relative species abundance we use fisher's alpha to determine this so here's 226 that had a whole bunch of species and a whole bunch of individuals. It didn't really have that high of a relative species abundance. Um, what's, what's driving this is that um, while we did have a lot of different species, we didn't have a lot of those different species. So not a lot of individuals from those different species, but we had a ton of like two different species. And so, those guys just drove up the number of individuals, um, but we would have just like singletons for other species. On the other hand, this guy who didn't have a lot of individuals but had a pretty decent amount of species richness has a, a, a very high relative species abundance. This is uh, the number of species broken down by site and sampling period. This is a little difficult to see, but what you need to take away from this is that there's some variability in the number of species during each sampling period. And this is the number of individuals uh, that we caught by site and sampling period. Um, once again, the graph's a little hard to see, but this is 226, lots and lots of individuals, 225 that's right next door. Lots and lots of individuals. There's 523. Just nothing much at all. And then when you look at relative species abundance or Fisher's diversity by site and sampling period, no one ever noticed that before. There's uh, 361. There's a lot of div relative species abundance there. Um, 361 is up by Baldy. Um, 404 and 405. 405 is a little bit degraded, but um, it's close to some nice stuff. Uh, pretty high uh, fissures. And then 523, really high. And now I'll look at some of these sites. I have some photos of some of the locations. And this is 523. Um, I mean, I was so unimpressed with 523 that I didn't even take my own photo. This is a, a stock photo of 523. So it had a, a moderately high number of species, a low number of individuals caught, but a high relative species abundance. This is site 466 out in the northern floodplain. Um, a, a very lovely site. And uh, four, so six, um, six rare well, considered rare because they're not found in this area. Rare bees came from this point. Um, uh, four of the six, so of the six rare bees that were found on MPG Ranch, four of them came from this place. This is 361 up by Baldy. Um, there's a going, I'm um, going bonkers with biscuit root here. Um, a very lovely site with lots of. Rocky Mountain Parnassian butterflies, which, by the way, once again, I'm not monitoring. Um, and then this is 367, uh, kind of a ridge coming off of Baldy, mostly native vegetation. There's my children out there enjoying the view. Um, it had moderate fishers diversity, moderate species, um, relative species abundance. Here's Chris and Tegan, probably unsuccessfully looking, un, unsuccessfully looking for bees to net in the middle of August. Uh, that was really a dead time in any of our uh, sampling areas, except where there were things like knapweed, because uh, there's just not na native stuff just wasn't really blooming in these places at that time. This is 105 out on the sagebrush steppe. And here's the um, 108 in the former crested wheatgrass area. This was nuked in um, May of this year, I think. Is it May? 
and uh, it had a moderate Fisher's diversity, and I was kind of stumped by this, and, and I guess what I, I, I wasn't, um, I, I had to think about this for a while because, you know, it just, I didn't understand it, but then I remembered that um, our bees are ground nesters, and so last year, this was all a crested wheatgrass field, and um, bees, there were, you know, obviously, or probably some forbs intermixed, and there were bees that were using this site. They emerged uh, this year to find that there wasn't a whole lot for them anymore, as you can see, for acres and acres. So essentially what I was sampling in these sites was last year's bee population. And this is 226 in the North Center pivot in uh, early September, middle September. There's Brian trying to find plot center. That plot doesn't have a stake, so you have to GPS it. And this is the site that had um, lots of individuals, lots of different species, but a low um, relative species diversity. And now we'll look at some cool bee pictures. <coughs> So these are some MPG bees. This is a golden northern bumblebee here, and the Stellus banachi, that's that rare bee that um, we doubled the known collections of. You can see bees uh, have a huge size range. Um, all these bee photos, by the way, were taken by Schuyler Burroughs at the Bee Lab. This is one of our most abundant species on the ranch, the green metallic sweat bee. You guys have probably seen these around Agapostum and Texanus. Of the 11,000 bees that we got, um, about 2,000 of them were, were, were these. And here's a side view. This is Stellus banachi. It probably has a little pollen on it. This is probably a pan trap bee. And uh, that's a mason bee. I mean, if you don't catch these bees, you don't see how in incredibly beautiful they are. You just kind of, you swat at them in annoyance and, and um, but they're, they're, they're really neat, so we kill them. Um, <laughs> then this is a, a Bombus californicus, or California bumblebee. So there's this species and this species, the golden northern bumblebee, are, um, there's taxonomic issues with them. They don't co-occur very often, but they, they do at several points on the ranch. And so um, a researcher at the Bee Lab has, is, um, in order to resolve some of these hybridizations and uh, taxonomic questions, they've taken genetic material, essentially legs, from 15 of our bees to use to, um, to do some genetic work. So our research is precipitating other people's research, which is really neat. And here's some of the conclusions we've come up with so far. Uh, so objective one was to document species richness and abundance in the monitoring sites, and that's what we're doing. Um, we're continuing sampling efforts to provide insight into how and if it may vary from year to year. We'd expect it would vary. Uh, bee populations are dynamic, and so um, we'll continue on. The second objective to monitor how bee communities change in response to restoration treatments is more of a long-term thing. Uh, we need some, as, so as the restoration sites are returned to more functional ecosystems, then we expect that the species, relative species abundance of the bee communities will change as well. And the third objective to contribute to the knowledge base regarding bees in this area, I mean, I think we've done that um, in a big way. All our bees are entered into the bee biology and systematics labs database. That collection data that we've given to them um, is accessible to anyone. And in the future, we'll probably have, if we continue with netting, then we'll have um, netters record the floral relationship. So basically recording what bees were taking off of what flowers. And then that's a new aspect of the bee labs database that they're going to start adding. Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank everyone who helped me. A lot of people helped out. I'd also like to thank all the bees. And uh, this is, there's the work cited um, with the website there. So at, at that, I'll open it for questions. Mm -hmm.